welcome to everyone this morning. Our Bible reading is from Acts 19, verses 8 to 20. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them were obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went round driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to take you out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. May God speak to you through his word today. So let's pray. Father, as we um, reflect on what it is uh, to be recipients and, and bearers of your power, we pray for your grace upon us this morning, that you'd open our eyes to who you are and who you've made us to be, that you would rest upon us and that we would walk in the, in the life and the, in the light of Jesus in all that we do. Amen. Okay, so this morning, uh, I want to talk a bit about power. Here we go. <laughs> so, for most of us, power is something that can be quite useful for us to have, eh? Uh, the more power you have, the more things that you're able to do, the more that you're able to move. For example, pedal power will get you some distance. You know, um, if, you start, if you got yourself a bike, you could pedal your way to Wellington. Um, and you get there at some stage in the future. But with more power, you'll get there more quickly and with a lot less effort. And this is basically how power works. Power makes things happen for us. So for most of us, the more power we have, the better. Uh, but power is not simply about transport. There are all kinds of power. There's political power, which is the ability to get things done that you want to get done. Uh, there's intellectual power which is the power that you have when you know stuff that other people don't know, like the power Marie has when something goes wrong with my computer. Um, and I'll generally be lost, but she'll be able to figure out what the problem is. And that's because more often than not, she has more intellectual power than me, and I'm man enough to admit it. There we go. Um, and, and then there's financial power. You know, Some people have more power to make things happen because they have more money than any, um, other people. And then, of course, from a theological perspective, the Bible tells us that there's also spiritual power. Ephesians 6.12 tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, in other words, we're in a world where not only are there powers that we can see and utilize, there are also supernatural powers that we can't see. Powers that can shape and move our lives for good or for worse. So, so power is all around us and we can't escape it. 
But there are a couple of things it also pays to know about power. Power can sometimes be pretty deceptive. You know, it doesn't always deliver what you think. And this week I was reading a bit of a passage taken from a former um, British minister, a guy by the name of Baron George Brown. Has anyone heard of George Brown? Oh, really? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, apparently, and you guys will probably know a bit more than me, but um, George was a, a bit of a, um, a gifted politician. He was a gifted communicator who could have well been prime minister, apart from his ability to shoot himself in the foot. Um, perhaps like some of the politicians in this country. I don't know. I'll let you work that out yourself. But, but Harold had this to say about the power of politics. He said when he was a young man, he was passionate about seeing change in his country. In his view, society was a mess and needed someone to make things better. And so he thought, right, I'll get into the world of politics. So he got on the local council. But once he got onto council, he very quickly realised there were not really any meaningful decisions he could make there. So he needed to be somewhere where the decisions he made mattered. Uh, a place where there was real power. So what did he do? Decided to run for parliament. But before he got elected into parliament, he, well, as he got elected into parliament, he realised there that there wasn't as much power to change stuff as he had thought. You know, he could vote and he could debate stuff, but things didn't really change from where he was sitting. So he thought, well, what I really need to do is get into cabinet. You know, that's where the real, real power is, in the upper echelon of the government, because that's where real change took place. And, and then he, and so he finally arrived and he eventually got to the seat of Deputy Prime Minister. But there he realised that the power to change things that he was seeking was actually a bit of an illusion. Uh, people were just running from one issue to the next. Even in the top job, there was so much going on that you were virtually being carried by the winds of the next thing that came up, which led him to wonder, where is all this power? And unfortunately for George, it, it seems that he spent his latter years a bit of an unhappy man, disillusioned with all that life had to offer. But like the writer of Ecclesiastes, when he writes in um, chapter 1, what is the point of all of this? Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And, and I guess this highlights the problem of power. We all know that we need more of that stuff to make it happen. But yet it never really seems to offer everything it promises. There's also one other thing for us to know about power, and that is power is also very seductive. Uh, another British politician, going for the British politicians today, Lord Acton, was well known for his saying, um, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So in other words, the more power you have, the more likely you are to find yourself going off the rails. So power can be, in this sense, like a force of gravity that draws us in a, in a hellward direction, if you like. And this is a classic theme right throughout, um, throughout history. All the, all, the, all the great stories from Macbeth to the Lord of the Rings to the Godfather. There's this promise of, hey, just a little bit more power and I'll be able to sort things out. And that, that, that idea kind of often leads people down a, a dark path from which they can't escape. So with all this in mind, if power is something that we, need to, that we need to make things happen, so we can't avoid it, but power is also a corrupting influence that doesn't really seem to offer what it promises, how do we as Christians manage power? See, that's a question I'd like us to keep in the back of our minds when we come to this, uh, the, the, la the last chapter of this series in the book of Acts, chapter 19. Still got another series that I want to do of the last part of that, but we're going to kind of wind it up here. Um, and the, the reason why I want to talk about power is because in Acts chapter 19, what we see is a clash of two powers. Uh, this is the clash of the power of the kingdom of God versus the, plash, the uh, versus, I should say, the kingdom of the world, the power of the kingdom of the world. And the theologian N.T. Wright calls Acts chapter 19, he says, the high point of Paul's public ministry. And he calls it this because there is an overwhelming victory of the power of God in the city of Ephesus. So um, if you remember a couple of weeks ago when we left um, Paul, do you remember what city he was in? Uh, yeah, okay, two, three weeks ago, Athens. And then he went to... Right, yeah, Corinth, that's right, very good. And he spent a year and a half there, didn't he? And he, uh, he was um, building the church and developing some strong friendships. Uh, but after that, he left and he started wandering, jumped across the, the sea, if you like, um, into Turkey, 
started walking around that place. Um, and eventually he settled down in the city of Ephesus. And what we read in the, in the scriptures is after he had about three months sharing in the local synagogue with the Jews, Paul decided, okay, it's time to take the message to the Gentiles. So he shifted his base of operations to the local lecture halls of Tyrannus, which sounds a bit kind of dangerous. But actually, um, the halls of Tyrannus were actually, was actually the, the university in Ephesus. And in that, time, in that place, Paul spent the next two years reasoning with the crowds who came to hear him. Now, when it comes to the city of Ephesus, it's worth noticing that this was a pretty powerful town in the Roman Empire. Um, it was considered the most important city in Turkey because it was the central hub of the trade route between the eastern and the western parts of the Roman Empire. So everything went through Ephesus. It was a very wealthy city, but it was also a very religious city. Earlier in history, um, apparently a meteor had landed or meteorite had landed near Ephesus, and the locals deciding that this was a sign from God, they decided that this must be the goddess Artemis. And so they built this massive temple to house the meteorite in. And that, and that temple was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And people from all over the, that known world at the time came to pay their respects. But as well as wealth and religion, um, Ephesus tended to be also a supernatural center for the Roman Empire, with all kinds of types of cults tending to kind of gravitate towards Ephesus as well. Um, so with all of this going on, Ephesus had grown to become a very powerful city in the Roman Empire. It had financial power, it had political power. As a city with a university, it had intellectual power. And then as a central place of worship and magic, it was regarded as a place of supernatural power as well. And of course... This happened to be with Paul, where God sent the Apostle Paul for two years. So what happened in those two years? Well, as we'll see from a number of stories from that time, it indicates that uh, the power that God exercised in that city had a massive impact on Ephesus. So much so that by the time Paul left two years later, Ephesus was a different place altogether. So what happened? Well, first of all, what we read is, uh, intellectually, Paul was very well received by the Gentiles of the city. So, um, and it wasn't just for the, two, for, for the people of the city, but actually for two years, it says people from all around that region of Asia, which was Turkey, they all came to hear Paul speak. Um, to, to the point that by the time he'd finished, everybody in that region knew who Jesus was. And that shouldn't be too surprising for us because we know that Paul was a highly skilled communicator. He was a very clever boy. He was trained from an early age in the scriptures, so he knew his stuff. So there was in, the intellectual power that God kind of used Paul, through Paul. But alongside that intellectual power on display, we're also told that there was a fair amount of spiritual uh, power on display as well. We're told um, that at that time God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. That even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were placed upon the sick and their illnesses were healed. You know, it's not like Paul wasn't doing miracles at other times during his ministry. But the inference here in Acts is that this time it was almost like God kind of turned up the, turned up the tap a little bit. Um, so there was a, more of a, an outpouring of God's power on display in Ephesus than there had been any time earlier. And that wasn't simply just to do with Paul either. God was doing miracles all over the place. We're told in verses 13 to 19 that some others, um, um, some others, seven sons of a Jewish priest who dabbled in supernatural kind of practices, began to take notice of what Paul was doing and started to use the name of Jesus in their own incantations. But of course, we discover it didn't go that well. Um, they used it on a, a possessed person who replied to them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Which is kind of, kind of a bit spooky. Because uh, I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't be said as a nice friend in a nice friendly voice like me. Uh, but anyway, that possessed man kind of turned on all seven of them and bent them senseless. And word got out. So, many, so, so, so much so that a lot of the people who put their trust and practices in magic um, just threw it away and decided to put their trust in Jesus. And this was a significant event because when the Bible says 50,000 drachmas of gear was destroyed, do you know how much that comes to in these today's prices? It's close to $10 million. So this wasn't like a small little event that happened in a little countryside. 
Um, and in, so in two years, we had this significant shift in understanding of what constitutes intellectual and spiritual power within the city of Ephesus. But then towards the end of this time, we have a real indication of the nature of the power shift going on in Ephesus when we see people start to vote with their pockets. Because um, carrying on from this, in Acts chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, we read about a silversmith named Demetrius. And Demetrius's business was actually creating idols to sell to the people who came to visit Ephesus. And one day we're told that he gathered his fellow craftsmen around him, the union of idol makers. I don't know what they'd call that. And he says to his friends, he says, guys, he says, you know that we do pretty well out of this work. And you see how Paul is um, convinced and led astray a number of the people of Ephesus and practically the whole province of Asia. He says, the gods made by our hands are no gods at all. Shock horror. And, but then he said, there's a danger. Our trade will lose its name. But not only that, the temple of Artemis will be discredited. Um, and and so, he, so he starts to get this crowd riled up. And the question's got to be asked, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is something I've noticed um, even in churches from time to time. And that is money. When money becomes an issue, that's when people start to get serious. Or often it's when people start to panic. Because finance has power. This is what Demetrius was worried about, wasn't it? What's going to happen if we don't have any, if no one's going to buy our idols? And, and what that shows is over two years, the message of the gospel had such an impact in the city of Ephesus. It was starting to affect what people chose to spend their money on. To, to, to the degree that one of the most profitable industries in Ephesus began to realize that they were losing money. And so they began this riot, which actually ultimately, ultimately didn't actually lead to that much changing. But the riot was simply a sign that a new power was emerging. And people just didn't know how to respond to it. And this was a power that began to shape Ephesus, and it would go on to shape the world. It was the power of the gospel. And I tell you what, that does sound attractive, doesn't it? You might ask yourself, hey, wouldn't it be great if God did something similar here? But in asking yourself that question, think about this. What makes this power different from any of the other promises of power the world offers? And that's a really important question for us to ask ourselves. Because I don't think we always kind of comprehend or think this through as Christians. Because power is always power. None of us are immune to that kind of seductive and corrosive temptation of power. But there's a real important difference between the power of the world and the power of the gospel um, that we really need to take note of. And that is the power of the gospel is a power that makes itself known in our weakness. It's not made known in our strength. And we see this power demonstrated on the cross where Jesus died in order to reveal the glory of God. But we also see it in the life of the Apostle Paul too. When he wrote to the um, Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul had this to say about what he'd learned about realizing the source of God's power in his ministry. He said, Jesus said this to me, he said, My grace is sufficient to you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfectly in weakness. And Paul went on to say, Therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness, that Christ's power might rest on me. To put this passage in a bit more context, prior to this passage, Paul is saying that he was having a bit of an argument with Jesus. Um, that he felt helpless in a certain situation. He was complaining about some restrictions that he was struggling against that were preventing him from reaching his potential, if you like. And so he prayed, if only you could deal with these areas of my life, Jesus, then, hey, I'd be free to do all the good things that I know I can do. I mean, has anyone had this argument with God before? Yeah. You know, if only certain people could listen to me, God. If only I had more money. If only I had a role of more significance, then things would be different. But what was Jesus' response to Paul? My power is made perfect in your weakness. My power was not made for you to control situations, so stop chasing after things I haven't given you. Be content with what I've given you. 
be at rest and trust I'll give you what you need when you need it. And what we see here is Paul had come to understand that the power of God was not something that he could control. Instead, it was something that would rest on him as Jesus offered it. So therefore, Paul's view of power was very different from the view of power that many of the people of his time had and probably many of us have from time to time. Power was not to be achieved. Instead, power was to be received. And this is why he could say, this is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Because when I am weak, then I'm strong. See, the secret of power in the kingdom of God is realising that it's not something we need to harness in order for us to shape society, like you would harness other forms of power. Instead, God's power is something that we have access to as we follow him. We receive it rather than earn it. And I suggest to you that this is why prayer is such an important element of our Christian life. Because prayer is not like us trying to bend God's ear to to make him do what we think ought to be done. Instead, prayer is learning us, uh, us learning to still ourselves, to be obedient, to respond to what he's calling us to do. As we make a practice of resting and surrendering to him, that's where God's power is found. And surrender. So with that in mind, can I encourage you this week to make time to rest in God's presence, to acknowledge your weaknesses, And to trust in his ability to use you. um, And and use his power for whatever situation that you might find yourself in. See, the power of God's church rests on us. Of God's presence rests on us when we come before him and pray in this way. So let's start with prayer this morning. Father God, we want to come before you. And we want to acknowledge there's many ways that we'd like to see your power being released in our community. We would love to see revival break out in our streets. We would love to see people turning to you in their hour of need. We would love to see you at work in our own lives. But Lord, if we're being honest, we'd rather not have to face up to the challenges that are before us. We would rather not have to battle with tiredness and disappointment, or even even with the failures of our own personal lives. Lord, the truth is, most of the time we feel anything but powerful. But you say that the power of the gospel is not in our abilities, but in your power resting on us. So therefore, when we feel weak, we can rejoice that Jesus' strength is upon us. So Father, I pray as your church that you would rest on us, that you would equip us for the road ahead, that you would give us the wisdom and the strength and the love that we need. And that your power would rest on us in Jesus' name. Amen.